we'll spend a moment now looking at our scripture memory verse for the month. So this will be our last chance to look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 20 together. By Paul and Brother Sam, we'll get the verse up in a moment. We'll look at the verse together. Thank you, Brother. Thank you. All right, just so quickly so in terms of announcements, so don't forget, pastor sent a message all around. We do have an important business meeting today straight after the morning service. We need to make a change to our constitution to actually help facilitate business meetings easier. So um, all members are required to attend because we do need, need 75% of the members to be here in order to vote this change in. Okay, so lunch is being provided today, and some of you may have brought something with you. But lunch will be provided today um, for all those that are staying for the lunch. And not just members are, um, are welcome. Anyone is allowed to come to our business meetings. So straight after the morning service, we'll be having that business meeting. And just lastly, so we've had some camp photos up just before. So today is the last day to register for camp. So next weekend is the Easter long weekend, and we'll be going down to Bustleton as a church to have family camp. Uh, Brother Chris Hustler is our speaker, as you know. But for those of you that unfortunately can't make it, we will still have Sunday service here at the church at 10.30. Uh, Brother Ken will be preaching the message. So for those of you that can't come, church will still be on here and Brother Ken will be taking the message. All right, that's all I'll mention for notices. At this time, we do have the choir. The choir's got a special for each one and each and every one of you. So I'm gonna invite the choir to come up and present this special for you.
Right. Your hymnals with me once again. We're going to turn this time to number 267. Number 267. Well, not too sure if I know this one, but the song is titled, Yes, I Know. Number 267 in our hymnals. We'll sing the first, the second, and then we'll sing the last verse. So number 267, the song is titled, Yes, I Know. our shorter songs now in choruses so they'll be up here on the screen so join us as we sing these next three songs we're going to sing jehovah jireh and then we're going to follow that with for god so loved the world and then we're going to sing seek ye first so let's start with jehovah jireh <laughs>
just to thank the Lord for his gifts and tithes and offerings. So the offering bag is at the back table for you to put in your gift at any time you like. But at this time, we'll just thank the Lord for the gift that is given. Can I ask Dr. Herbert, could you lead us in a prayer of thanks for the offering? Thank you, Dr. Amen. All right, so we'll sing our final hymn before we have Pastor come up for the message. So turn to number 258. Let's all stand together as we turn to number 258 to sing our final hymn. The hymn is titled, Christ Receiveth Sinful Men. We'll sing the first, and then we'll move on to the third, and then the fourth verse. So number 258 in your hymnals, Christ Receiveth Sinful Men. the crèche and the junior church at this time. Good morning, it's good to see you. Yeah, beautiful day outside. Do we have a first time visitor here this morning? First time here? Okay. Thank, welcome, yeah, God bless you, thank you for coming. Good to have you with us. Everyone is welcome to stay after the service for the lunch we're gonna have, and also if you wanna attend the little business meeting we've gotta to have to change an article there in the Constitution. We got an issue because we worked on a quorum before having to have so many have business meetings but as the, with merging the two churches together and all the new members and other people coming, members coming in. It's getting hard to have a quorum for a business meeting. So if we just take that out of the Constitution to having have to have a quorum to announcing it two weeks in advance and also emailing it or posting it to every member. So everybody knows in advance before the meeting and then all votes have to be, our motions, ha all motions have to be passed by a two-third vote. Then that will help relieve all the problems. And everybody knows what's happening whenever we have motions in the church. Okay, so everybody's welcome to stay after. 
and tonight is the tomb hunt. All the young ones went in there, didn't they? Yeah. But Easter eggs here are tombs, because when you bite into it, it's empty, right? And so it's a tomb hunt. Tonight is our tomb hunt, okay? And so we'll be going over to the park, and some of the leaders will take the tombs and hide them out there. And then when everybody gets a tomb, we're all going to bite in them and see that Jesus has risen. <laughs> yeah, he's not there. Okay, want to have our prayer time here. And uh, Ian's doing well, Yoski, nothing. I didn't see him yesterday. I saw him on Friday. Not as what? Has he gone down a little bit since the other day? Okay, we'll continue. We're going to continue praying for him. Uh, but I was with him there on Friday. And, uh, yeah, it looked like good. Doctors say he, they think they, something's wrong with his kidneys. But they don't know. Nothing too serious. They'll look on it, at it, that is, after he gets healed from this off. Yeah. So continue praying for Ian at this, at this time. And uh, Elizabeth over in Uruguay for Daniel. Her brother had the heart operation. And so continue to pray for his recovery there, for Daniel over there. And the camp next week. Pray for safety, everybody going down and coming back. Uh, just pray that God will really bless Brother Chris and his messages uh, during that time. The weather looks on the apps looks really good for next week. It's early uh, here. You know, the one we've had late camps in April, sometimes they get kind of cool. But this one's looking real good for the weather next week. So today is basically the last day to put your registration in. So some of you boys that are going, you know, you haven't put your registration, give it to us, please. Uh, at least let us know you're coming because this week we're buying the food. And we need to know how many are there and how much food we buy. Okay, so please give us your information if you're coming or not. Okay, I'll have a moment of prayer and then we'll have our congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for the privilege it is to worship you this morning. And Lord, we give you all the praise and all the honor is yours. And Lord, we pray for Ian in the hospital. And Father, we know that this is, uh, Father, not an easy time right after an operation, especially the reattachment of a bowel. But Lord, we pray and thank you the cancer has not returned. And we pray it will never return. And Lord, that uh, this healing will take place there and help him through these months of healing process. And Lord, we know it won't be easy, but we pray for no infection to set in. And then Lord, we just uh, pray for Daniel over in Uruguay. And we thank you Elizabeth is there. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that she's able to be a help. And Lord, but we pray for your healing hand upon Daniel. And may Father, he have no complications also from this heart operation. And so, Father, we pray for your spirit to have your way this morning in our midst. And Lord, we thank you that our salvation is free. As we've sang this morning, the vilest sinner can find forgiveness. The door of heaven, the door of heaven was open to all, to any who will call upon our Savior to ask for his forgiveness and his cleansing. And so, Lord, May your, you use your message of your word in our hearts this morning to instill in us again the fact of Father having hearts that are sensitive to the hearts around us, to souls that need Jesus. And so Lord, we pray for your work to be done. If there be someone here this morning without Christ, we pray this morning they would receive him. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen, and then we'll have our congregational prayers up here. First one here. Uh, is this on? This may not be on. Okay. Let's see here. I, oh, yeah, it seems to be on. Let's try again. There we go. Okay. We get past that. Our first prayer, here we are. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, you said by Paul in the book of Romans, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? 
Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we who have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior into our hearts, thank you. We are saved from your wrath through Jesus Christ, shedding his blood on the cross for our sins and raising again the third day according to the scriptures. Yet our Father, you know how weak and faithless we, your children, can be at times. We are sorry for yielding to sinful choices and thank you for your daily forgiveness through Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that any sinful conduct in our lives grieves you and dishonors your presence in our lives. Grant us by the Holy Spirit repentant wills from the heart that yield daily to you. Fill us with thy spirit. Thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. This morning's message titled here is Believing. Believeth is enough for salvation. And that's a statement there. Yeah. Believing that believeth is enough for salvation. In 1981, I'll hold this book up here. In 1981, I attended a conference on evangelism at St. Stephen's Anglican Church in Cooperu, Brisbane, yeah, back in Queensland in those days. And... Uh, the uh, conference was really good. In fact, this Evangelism Explosion was a ministry and a teaching program for evangelism started by Dr. James Kennedy many years ago. My home church in the States had been using it for several years before I came to Australia. Anita and I came to Australia. And then it finally came to Australia in 1981. The first conference was down in Sydney. second conference was in Brisbane. And so I enrolled and went to it. And uh, there at that conference, and I still have inside here the list of the ministers, and their wives were welcome to come. Here's a, as you open it up, there you can see a list. You can't see the names nationally. But the top of the list is the Anglican ministers, and that's all these are Church of England ministers there in Queensland who were attending the conference. This list here, second list, are Baptist Union pastors who were attending the conference. And these four names down here, are independent Baptists who were attending the conference. <laughs> Me and one other fellow from our church and two others uh, were there at the conference. Uh, I just wonder how many of these people would be there today. That was over 40 years ago at that conference on evangelism. But the minister, the, re the right reverend, and I can't remember his last name now, and they haven't got him because he was the host pastor, and so his name wasn't on that list. He was the host pastor. He actually had gone to America and been trained in America, that Anglican pastor of St. Stephen's of Cooperu, and he was hosting that conference. And during the conference, it came down to the aspect of how to help a person pray to receive Christ as their Savior into their heart. And when we came to that section of study, it was a week-long conference, every night for a week and all day on a Saturday. And when it came to that section of receiving Christ as your Savior, the Anglicans got very annoyed. Let's use that word. Okay? They were coughing and, and doing stomping the floor. And as, as the presenter of the ministry, who was a Yank that they brought over to teach the program, who'd been a, one of the teachers of this program for several years, for several years uh, he finally stopped and he said, gentlemen, what is wrong? Why are you having such a problem? He says, you're giving us uh, heart problems with you talking about receiving Jesus Christ. What? I'm giving you heart problems. And the canon, the canon of the Anglican Church was there. And he said, yes, he said, yes, you give me spiritual indigestion when you talk about receiving Jesus as your Savior. What? Spiritual indigestion? I'll never forget his words. So finally, then the host uh, Anglican minister of the St. Stephen's, he got up and said, gentlemen, yes, we have different denominations here and we have different perspectives on our faith in Christ. Let me share with you my testimony. And he had been a rector for 20 some years in the Anglican church, going along with all the teachings of the Anglicanism. 
And uh, he said that one day I heard about the reality of personally knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, I am paraphrasing what he said, but this is what he was saying. And he accepted Jesus Christ into his heart. And he said, I had a true born-again experience. Now, he didn't become a charismatic. You say, well, did he speak? No, he didn't speak in tongues. He just accepted Christ as his Savior. And now he knew he had a different relationship with Jesus, that Jesus had come into his heart. <gasps> the Anglican ministers at their tables, and there's about 25 of them in that list, that big list there. Boy, they were having a problem. They were pushing their chairs back. Some of them turned around and looked away from him. Some of them pounded the table. They were really distraught over him talking about it. The Baptist Union guys that were sitting over here, and, and we were sitting, those four that were independent, we were sitting with them over there. In fact, one of the guys sitting across from me I was talking to was Paul Boots. Paul Boots was the founder of Kuron. All the Kuron start, started with Paul Boots, from, and he'd come down from New South Wales for the conference. And, uh, and oh, the Baptists were, many of them were pounding the table too. Here, 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 here. <laughs> yeah, that was going on. Sounded like Parliament House there, <laughs> okay? Between the Anglicans and the Baptists. But the, uh, the rector of St. Stephen shared how he now had Jesus Christ in his heart and his life. And he says, so gentlemen, we're going to have to be respectful of each other, and we will continue the conference now showing Christian respect for each other and our different viewpoints on this. Okay? And so I share that with you because over the years at that conference, I learned many, many good illustrations on how to share the gospel with other people. And I've taken many courses on evangelism through Bible college and through seminary, when I was in seminary and through different courses. Yeah, just always trying to make myself more efficient in sharing Jesus with others, how others can make a decision on the spot. This is the thing, sharing the gospel. And as you're sharing the gospel, you can come to that statement that says, now, does this make sense? So when the person says, yeah, it does make sense. Would you like to right now receive Jesus as your Savior? Right now. There's many people that should be in the kingdom of God that are being held back because we will not come to that important moment where we center the message to their heart. And the one reason why we don't center it and ask them that question is because we don't feel we've made it clear. We're always thinking, did I really share enough? Did, you know, we don't have the confidence that they should pray. But when you have learned how to share Christ and know that simple salvation is simple belief in what the scripture says. And so this is why we're having this message. On Wednesday nights, I'm going through soul winning. Those of you who tuned in, I've got my book here, my soul winning. If you've missed some of the lessons, I've got extra copies of the lessons here. And we got about 10 lessons we're going to do all together. And we'll be looking at different ways to share Christ with people. But churches today are not training their congregation in how to share Jesus, where they can bring a person to a decision as they talk to them. And I've seen many people doing street work over the years. I've seen many people right on the streets pray. I mean, uh, over the years, seeing people right there standing to the side off the street, the patchway, and we stand in a little corridor somewhere, and they pray and accept Christ as their Savior. Just like we had last week a guy at McDonald's there in the city after passing out tracks, a guy prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior. So this morning we're going to look at number one as we go through these verses. Peter learns that whosoever believeth can have salvation. That whosoever believeth can have salvation. What biblical believing is, what biblical believing is not, what biblical believing is for salvation, and what some think, why some think biblical believing is not enough. Okay, so let's go through our text. Now we're going to look at Acts chapter 1, I mean Acts chapter 10 here. We're going to read through this, follow me here, but we're going to find that Peter learns that whosoever believeth can have salvation. You've got to remember, these Jews were so, so prejudiced. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? 
And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. So here we have a Roman centurion. Okay. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild boosts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So he was truly kosher. Okay? And the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God has cleansed, that, that call not thou common. And this was done twice. That's three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, which was called, which was surnamed Peter, uh, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, that is also can be translated righteous man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, lodged him, and on the morrow Peter went away with them. And certain brethren, very important, he takes some other brethren, some other Jewish men from Joppa accompany him. you got to remember, the church right now is all Jews and proselytes that who have come into Judaism. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him. And fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into one of another nation. So there it is. Now that's not what God had said. Okay, This is what the Jews had come to practice. That it was an unlawful thing for a man and a Jew to keep company or to come unto another person from another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You cannot have prejudice in God's church. Okay? And, and yet over the years I have found that so many churches are prejudiced. And Cornelius said, for days ago I was fasting until this hour. Or four days ago, I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance and sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Then Peter opened his mouth, okay, and said, Of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Okay, so Peter is learning that when Jesus said, whosoever, it means anyone, okay? We went over that last week, last Sunday night. We went over it with the young people about what does whosoever mean. And finally, one of the children said, it means, Pastor, everyone. And that's what it means, everyone, even people. Oh, Caleb's not here. He's from Victoria. So I... I I drill that into their minds. Even Victorians can get saved, okay? He's a tiger man, okay? 
Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now that righteousness is not our righteousness, it's God's righteousness. It's those who have come to put their faith in him. Remember, our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. Nothing that you can ever do will bring you close to God. It's only God working through you. And the first thing you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. You have to believe. Verse 36 now. So the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, that's the Holy Spirit, and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, he is now speaking, Peter is speaking to the crowd there in the home of Cornelius. He's speaking to that crowd of friends and relatives that Cornelius has brought to his home to meet Peter. And we are witnesses, verse 39, of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So here, hear the gospel coming forth, what Christ did, the good news, <laughs> the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, not to all the people, but so who did he show himself to after he rose? Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen bef before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So Peter was one of those witnesses who ate. Now notice what it says there again, various times in scripture, that after Jesus rose, he ate and drank with the disciples. Okay, in the millennium, in our spiritual bodies, Jesus was in his spiritual body. Okay, and we will eat again in the new kingdom. And so, yeah, here we find, uh, find the meeting. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick. Old English here means the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever. Now notice what Peter, this is Peter preaching, telling the people sitting in the house there. It's a house service, home church, so to speak. The, the first home church, Christian home church taking place. Maybe not the Jews we've been doing it in Jerusalem, okay? but among the Gentiles, to whom give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, those very words right there, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, let me ask you, did Peter put his hands on them? No. Okay, I've had people try to tell me that. Yeah, yeah. He simply was preaching the gospel message of who Christ was, how he died for his sins and rose. And if you'll believe it, you will get your sins also forgiven. Boom, here comes the Holy Spirit. They hear the word believe, and down comes the Spirit of God. So while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision. Now that's the Jews who came with Peter. Remember he took a company with him. And so happens that these Jews are definitely the ones who believe. You have to not only believe in Jesus, but you have to keep the law. They come to be known as Judaizers. Okay, This crowd of those who say that Gentile men come in, they've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law. Not only believe, but to be saved you have to do all this also. Which is heresy. Which is totally false. But they are the ones that are with Peter. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Guys, these have been prejudiced men all their lives. You Gentiles are worse than dogs. And God is going to take you into the church. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit came down upon these. And when did he come down? The moment they heard the words, believe. Believe what I've just shared with you, and your sins will be forgiven. Well, those, that's the text, right? You can't share it any other way. If you add anything else to it, then you're, you're distorting the scriptures. Please don't do that. Wow. So these, the, the Judaizers just can't believe it. The word there, astonishment, means that they, uh, they're out of their mind. 
this, everything they have believed all their life is changing. That is, if they want to let it change. they got to let it change. For they heard them speak. And what had happened? The Spirit came down and they spake in tongues. That is, they spake in other languages. In this, go to Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11. And that was the prophecy that the prophet Isaiah gave because of the hardness of the heart of the Jews that he would speak to them in other languages. Oh, well, to a Jew, there's only one language, right? And what's the language? Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah, that is God's language to a Jew. And God told him in Isaiah 20, 11, because of the drunkenness, even the priests were drunk. You read that chapter, you see how the priests are drunk. There's only vomit on the tables in the temple. That is what is being shared in that. And because of your hardness of heart, I will speak to you in other tongues, in other languages. Prophecy being fulfilled on this day, a sign. Because the Jews require what? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22, the Jews require a sign. And God gave them that sign. He spoke to them in other languages. Okay? And for they heard them speak of tongues that is languages and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water and these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry service. So after they accept Christ and they get baptized, they want Peter to stay with them longer. Now chapter 11. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were on the circumcision contended with him. Oh, there was those guys that heard it, but then they go back. And they're telling them, and every, the, the crowd, of, and there's a lot of these Jews that are of the circumcision crowd. You've got to keep the law. Saying, thou wentest into men uncircumcised. Just the first thing, the fact that, Peter, you walked into that house. That's unlawful. You went into a Gentile home. You're not clean anymore, is what they would be saying to Peter. Saying, thou wentest into the men uncircumcised, and you even did what? You ate with them? Okay. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the very beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying. So he goes all the way back to the vision. There in Joppa, when he receives the vision, when the Lord brings the sheet down, he tells them the whole story, how the Lord had, had prepared him to go there and to do this. And so we skip down to verse 15. So then as I began to speak, so now he talks about being in the house of Cornelius. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. The same way on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came down on us, the Spirit simply came down upon them. Then remembered I, Peter says, the word of the Lord, how that he said, G John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit. That is to be immersed. The word baptized, you see it, think immersed. We are now in God, and God is in us. And those Anglican ministers don't understand that, that Christ has come to live within us by his spirit. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Okay, now, the, now we find the word repentance. Did we see the word repent anywhere in the, in the story? No, not until now. And who's the ones that say they granted repentance? The Judaizers. Now, in my personal opinion here, I believe that when these Judaizers said, okay, praise the Lord, God has granted them repentance unto life, what does the word repent mean? To change your mind. To have a change in your thinking. So in their minds, what are these Jewish Judaizers thinking? These guys are now going to become Jews adopting what? All the Jewish commandments. That's what they believe. To be saved, you had to follow the Mosaic law and believe in Jesus. They added that to believing in Jesus. So I believe when they say granted them repentance, yeah, that they're going to repent of their Gentile culture. Not of their fact that they had rejected and didn't know who God was, but they're rejecting their culture as a Gentile. 
Everything among the Gentiles is wrong and evil. No, no, everything is not wrong and evil. <laughs> okay, yeah. Try to, try to serve up to a Judaizer a nice pork roast. They'll probably get a gun. If you're in America, they get a gun. <laughs> yeah, definitely get thrown out of the house. Yeah. So I can imagine these Judaizers and everybody say, yeah, we'll, we'll teach these guys. We'll tell them to make sure, you know, all you pig farmers sell all those pigs, get rid of the pigs, get yourself some gold or cheap, you know, and all you this, 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 you bakers, you don't put any more blood in your bread, you know, you know, baking the bread, right, you know. Yeah, okay. Ah, there's been so much. The, the God, you have to, when you read the scriptures, be very careful as you're reading to look at the context. Who said what? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glory, saying, well, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. What are they meaning when they say repentance? Okay? In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, we saw this on Wednesday night in the Wednesday night soul winning class, there about how Jesus says there in that verse, how you, you Pharisees, you cross land, you cross sea, you cross the sea and you cross lands to make a disciple, and you make that person what? Twofold the child of who? Hell. Yeah, then their false teachings, they weren't bringing people to a faith understanding of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what biblical believing is? Let's look here about going back to Acts chapter 2. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is Peter's sermon that day on the day of Pentecost as he's coming to the end of that first sermon after the Spirit came down. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, repent. Oh, so. so now he's speaking here to who? Now to Jews on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so he's not speaking to Gentiles. Well, repent of your culture? No, that's not, can't apply here. Well, there are those that would say, well, they, they gotta repent of all their sins. That's what they're saying. I've heard people tell that to me. Yeah, they've got to repent of all their sins. And no, that's not what is in focus here. That is not the context. What is the context in verse 36? They crucified the Savior, right? And that same Jesus whom you have crucified is who? He's the Lord in Christ. And the Jews there hearing that sermon are pricked in their hearts. He was. He said he was. We heard him at times talking, yeah. and he is. He is the Messiah we were waiting for. We crucified our Lord and, and Messiah. And what does Peter say? What do you got to do, first thing, when they say, what are we going to do? Repent. That is, stop rejecting your Savior and do what? Accept him. That is the context of the word repent. You've rejected him. You've killed him. You've crucified him. Now accept him as your Messiah and Savior. That is who he is. And that's their repentance. To accept the Savior who died for their sins. Because uh, look at the very bottom. I put on there from the Greek, the Greek word from the Strong's Concordance. I put that in there. And very simply, yeah, it means to think differently. What's your, you're going to change your understanding of who he is and accepting that he is your Savior he is your Messiah. He is your Lord. And then what do you do after you believe that? You believe that he's that? Then you get baptized, every one of you, in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you will, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You believe, stop rejecting and crucify and believe, and you follow him in baptism, and you at the, this is all taking place at the same time, and you'll get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very simple, Pat. A lot of people confuse that. Very simple, what biblical believing is. Let me share with you. As somebody many, many years ago, I don't know how many years is going on, but believing and repentance are the same coin of salvation. If you have a coin of salvation, one side it says believe or have faith, is faith is the same as belief, the other side it says repent. They're the same thing. You can't separate. Too many people try to say salvation is a belief. It's a change in your thinking. That is repentance. Okay? What biblical believing is, and here it is, the Greek word here for believeth, is uh, there in Strong's Concordance. The G stands for Greek, 
and it's listed as the 4,100th word in the Strong's, and it believeth, and there it means to have faith. And 4102 4, is a same is based upon the same root as bestow, and it means to have faith in, on, or respect to of a person or a thing. That is, it means credit by implication to entrust, uh, especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. Believe it can be translated believe or believer. Commit a trust in a committing relationship, put in trust with. These are all the different ways it's used in this Greek word, believeth. Here, here's some verses, uh, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So here we see believeth particularly is talking about the power of God. When you believe, well, here's an aspect of what believing is. You have received the power of God from that gospel message. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you try to work your way to heaven, then you're earning it. And God, you're making God, so to speak, owe it to you. But it doesn't work that way. God has not ordained it that way. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth. Here, believing is what? being declared innocent while you're still a sinner. That's what justification is all about, to be justified. Is God, Christ bore all of our guilt there on that cross, shedding his blood, covering our sins. The sins of the world were laid upon him, scripture says. And now the moment we believe, we're justified. We're declared innocent, judicially declared innocent while we are still yet sinners. What? That... When you understand that, the word grace takes on a whole new meaning. The depth of what it means. God's grace toward us. What he does for us. And then Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe it. We're no longer under the law. Christ is the end. I love this verse. The end of the law. I am now in Christ. I'm not under the law. But let me share with you, my faith in Christ is not a license to sin. Galatians makes that very clear in Galatians chapter 5. You know, we, uh, because I've been saved and justified, I don't have a license now to do whatever I want. Because Christ liveth in me. And this Christ's life within me will always lead me into holiness and godliness. Okay? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Righteousness comes through him and him alone. And so here's some of the the great aspects of what happens in believing is that we have the power of God. We've been declared righteous, justified. We have seen the end of the law for our lives. Now our focus is totally on one thing, following Christ and letting his word seep into our hearts so we, and we will keep all the commandments that God wants us to keep. And then still here looking at the word faith in the Greek again, uh, looking at Strong's and the word trust, Again, having the same basic root word as believe, the word faith, and is speaking about you know, reliance there, you know, looking in the middle of it, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, the word faith. It could be translated assurance, faith, belief, faith, fidelity. And the word trust, also the same root word as, as believeth in the Greek. It means to agree, to assure, believe, have confidence, to be wax confident, make a friend, obey, persuade. These are different ways these words are used in the scripture. And so as we see these words, believe has a meaning of action, not intellectual assent. What biblical believing is not, intellectual assent. James 2.19 here, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and what? Tremble. There is the intellectual assent. Like, for instance, uh, how many of you believe Captain Cook sailed around Australia and charted the coast, especially on the East Coast? If you've been to the Gold Coast and you've been on the border between Tweed Heads and Coolangatta, and there where the New South Wales border is, they got a monument up there, and there is an excerpt up there from the logbook of Captain Cook. How many people have been there, seen the excerpt? Yeah, on the, yeah, okay, you can see it right there. One foot in New South Wales, one foot in Queensland, and you're going to be looking at the logbook. Yeah, Captain Cook, yeah, I believe. I've seen that logbook of 
excerpt there. I believe he did sail and chart the coast, come from New Zealand and came over and charted up the coast, okay, of, uh, of uh, uh, the east coast of Australia, okay. Uh, there's a famous point there in New South Wales. Some of you may know, I think they call it Smoky Point. The reason it's got the name, that's what Captain Cook, first sight of land with some aboriginals probably having, uh, what do they call it? New Zealand, it's a hungy. Here it's a, okay, having a barbecue, yeah, fish barbecue. <laughs> and there's smoke, and the first thing Captain Cook, he saw, so, and then, so that's called Smoky Point, <laughs> where Captain Cook saw that. Okay, yeah, I believe it. But what's Captain Cook doing for me? What's he doing for you, Sam? Nothing. That's intellectual assent. We give, it, and so many Christians do that. They give intellectual assent to historical facts about Jesus. But they, that is not the belief that saves. You've got to go beyond that to the belief that acts, the action belief, the belief that says yes, that comes from the heart. I believe, and in that belief, you call out to him. You confess you're my savior and always first to him before anybody else. As the Holy Spirit's touching your heart in conviction, you just want to cry out. It's so true. If you're being convicted, you want to know, yeah, it lift your heart up to him. So, but there is that belief, and so many Christians follow it, that is simply intellectual acknowledgement. They know not Christ. That Anglican minister I told you about, for 20 years serving in the Anglican church, and oh, not all 20 years as a rector, but the last, I don't know how many years he'd been a rector in the Anglican church. Yeah, he wasn't saved. He was only given intellectual, intellectual acknowledgement to the historical facts that he had learned in his training. And so what, believing, what biblical believing is for salvation, that whosoever believeth in him. Now here's some verses. In John 3, 15, you see whosoever believeth in him. John 16, naturally, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Also Acts 10, 43, we read it there. Romans 9, 33, Romans 10, 11, all have that very same little phrase, that whosoever believeth in him. That's in all those verses that plus others, okay? God keeps re-emphasizing it to us. And what is it? It's believing that Jesus Christ, the God's Son, is the sin bearer who shed his blood for all of mankind. All of mankind. To offer forgiveness for all sins and the gift of eternal life to all who will believe, confessing with our mouth to him and others, he's our Savior and our Lord. That's what belief is all about. This is the action of biblical action that comes forth of biblical belief that comes from our heart and life. We respond to what we come to hear and to know from the heart. And this is the response that the Spirit will bring forth in a person's life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath what? Everlasting life. What is that believing all about? A response that comes from your heart of giving acknowledgement that Jesus is my Savior for my sins. I confess that because I've called out to him and acknowledged you're my Savior. In Romans 10, 9, it says that if thou shalt confess, notice the little star there, go down to the bottom of the page, and confess means simply to acknowledge, to give assent to. So if thou shalt give a knowledge to with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is the Lord, he is the Savior, the God, everything that's wrapped into him being Lord and what he did for us, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man what? Believeth. This is biblical belief unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Who, oh, there it is, whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? Ashamed. Okay? You shall not be ashamed. Christ has come to live in your heart and your life. In the very same chapter, going down to verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that what? Get that? That's why let me share with you. These Calvinists, you just tell it and leave it. People don't, like often when I'm passing out tracks, I share with people, see back in the back of the track, right in the back of that track, there's a prayer back there. You can pray if you mean it from your heart. I want them to know, just not to hear the gospel, but how to apply the gospel. 
So many times we don't let them be know how. We said, Jesus died for you. He loves you. Yeah. And it goes along that way. You share something. You don't tell them how to apply it. And they need to know how to apply it. I've spoken and shared gospel with people over the years. And people say, yeah, you know, a lot of it I believe. But I didn't know what to do after that. I said, nobody ever told you how to accept Jesus? No, I've never heard you, how you got to accept him. <laughs> you got to call out to him. For the same Lord over all is written to all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's believing. When you're believing, you want to confess. You want to call out. You want to acknowledge that in your heart. Belief, biblical belief, has an action. Now then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So biblical believing for salvation is that fact that the heart wants to do something. And that is call out to him. Biblical belief has action within it. Okay? So why some think believing is not enough? Well, they say good works and obeying the commandments is the basis for and the keeping of salvation. I'll read that again slower. They see good works and obeying the commandments as the basis for, that is for salvation, and the keeping of salvation. So to keep it, you've got to keep up the law. This is Judaizer type teaching and from the Jews. And not as the results. Works is always the results of salvation, not the means of salvation. The means is the cross and believing what he did for us on that cross and rising again. They don't understand biblical believing. It's God's way and not man's way. They interject too much human perspective into the clear teaching of God's word. That's so often. They're taking their human lifestyle where we say, yeah, you do me right, I'll do you right. You do me right, I'll do you right. That is the way we think, yeah? You, you pat me on the back, I'll pat you on the back. But God says, yeah, we were all sinners, we didn't deserve it. And yet he still loves us. So Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See that chair over there? How many of you believe... Okay, we don't have the lapel mic today, so I have to turn this around here. How many of you believe that chair? Oh, let's just focus here. Sam. No, no, we won't pick on Sam. We'll pick on Azure. Azure, do you believe that chair exists? Okay. You can see it, right? You can handle it. Right. Uh, do you believe that chair there would hold you up? Are you sure? You want to check it over first? Yeah, come check it over. Okay. See if that's, yeah, make sure that chair would hold you up. Does it look like, it looks like it's strong enough? Maybe. Maybe. Don't sit in it, don't sit in it, just look at it, you okay? Look okay. Okay, think it holds you up. Okay. Now, I'm, I've got a really difficult question for you. Why isn't that chair holding you up? Because I'm not sitting in it. Ah. Did he get it right? Are you sure you got it right? Yeah, he did, he got it right. Now, let me show you. In sharing the gospel in many a home with people, even on streets, I've used this illustration. I t was learned it at Evangelism Explosion. Okay. And Peter Rame did it also, that not fully this way, with the young people a couple weeks ago. Peter did it in the, in the youth night. But yeah, it's not holding you up. Okay. Okay. Would you sit in this chair real quick? So you're, sitting, you're standing in somebody in somebody's home, they're usually sitting in chairs around the kitchen table, yeah. often with me. Yeah. They ask you, oh, you want to sit somewhere? If there's a kitchen table nearby, say, can we sit at the kitchen table? So you drink your coffee better there, okay? Instead of sitting on a lounge. And, uh, but I usually sit at the kitchen table. Now, take this chair that you're sitting in right now, and let's let that chair represent you and your will <coughs> and your life is being represented by that chair. All the choices you've ever made in life, Everything that you've ever done in life, that chair represents. That chair over there represents Jesus Christ. As that we've been sharing the gospel with you, did it make sense what I shared with you, what he did for you at the cross? 
that he died for you and he rose again and he offers you eternal life in heaven and a life in this world but he has a plan for you if that chair represents now Jesus and all what salvation encompasses can I ask you would you make a choice which chair would you like to have your life in this chair or that chair over there and that chair over there. What do you got to do to have that chair? Go sit in it. Go sit in it. <laughs> simple, simple illustration. Often you have to tell a piece of, now I'm not trying to, to uh, uh, embarrass you here. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but it's a simple illustration. So just as you got up out of this chair and you now, Azure, have gone to sit in this chair. That's what it means to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is that, oh, I don't have the mic. Okay. That's what it means to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is that you are going to move your heart and life and ambitions from the life that you have planned to wanting the life that Christ has for you as he will forgive you of all your sins. He will forgive you of everything you've ever done. And he wants to come and live in your heart and your life. Are you willing to make that decision to come to Christ and accept everything he has for you? Absolutely. Okay. If that is sure in your heart right now, I can lead us in a prayer, and I'd like to pray for you first, and then you can pray yourself, or you can pray short phrases after me and accept Jesus Christ and tell him that you believe upon him as your savior for your sins and you want the life that he has for you and knowing that he's going to forgive all your sins. Would you like to pray that prayer? I would, yes. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He didn't know I was gonna do that, okay? <laughs> belief, belief illustrated here in the two chairs. Some of you might have seen it been done before. It's been around for a long time. But the way I saw it illustrated with EE is a year, the way I've used it for quite a few years with people. Helping people to truly acknowledge that they want Jesus in their heart and their life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Lord is the vast majority, maybe every one of us here have made that decision. Where we've left the chair of our will and we've come to accept Christ, your will, to know the forgiveness of sin, to know that heaven is our home. And Lord, we thank you for that great work that only you could do of your marvelous grace of making us your children because we believed what we heard as the Spirit convicted us, as the Spirit of God touched our hearts and our lives, and we called out saying, yes, I want your forgiveness. But Lord, if there's a soul here this morning that hasn't made that or there's any doubt in their heart, their life, may they make sure this morning and call out, telling you they believe and they want your will and only the will and life that you have for them. And Lord, we as Christians, help us, Father. It's so easy to be Father, easily drawn away with all the activities again and all the effort and the work of just living in this world, but Lord, to program our minds and thoughts to be Father soul winners, to be thinking of others, and how we can be the light of Christ that you want us to be, your testimony going forth, not only in words, I mean, not only in action, but in words, of helping people find Jesus, of making that decision to ask Jesus to call out to be their savior. Touch our hearts this morning, Father, with how you want to apply this message to every one of our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, our hymn this morning is not in the hymn book. It's up here on the screen, I believe. May we stand as we sing to
Thank you.